Hi, welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video is going to be the seventh one in a series of videos on Jean-Paul Sartre's ontological exploration of the structure of being. So, uh, in the last video in the series, the thing we ended off with was explaining a bunch of technical vocabulary that Sartre uses in Being and Nothingness that'll no that will enable you to understand the next two segments of your reading assignment. You may have noticed when we started that technical vocabulary that all of a sudden the difficulty level of these videos got a lot higher. And the reason is because when we were looking at Sartre's essay, The Humanism of Existentialism, we were looking at something that he explicitly wrote to explain existentialism to everyday people. When we're looking at technical vocabulary from being and nothingness, he's not going to be doing that. So being and nothingness is definitely a lot more demanding and the vocabulary is a lot more demanding. The ideas are definitely trickier to follow. And probably the trickiest idea that we talked about in the last video was this idea that the for itself, which is to say consciousness, is essentially a nihilation, an ongoing nihilation. So the intentionality of the for itself is marked by an ongoing kind of negation. And that's tricky because that's definitely not how we typically think of our awareness or our consciousness or what it's doing or how it's operating and that sort of thing. So uh, basically, to get a handle on that, you have to realize uh, that things are for us what they are by dint of the fact that they're not what they are not. In other words, what objects, let's say, ob what objects, always good to have an example, what objects are not in a way implicitly defines what they are. So this hat is a hat by its dint of its not being the wall back there, the chair back there, the laptop right over there, a shirt, and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit like an art class. You know, if you ever took art classes where they teach you drawing, one of the exercises they have you do when they teach you drawing is called a figure ground exercise. And the trick in a figure ground exercise is that you learn to draw objects by drawing their background, okay? So usually when you draw an object, when you're in elementary school and you try to draw an object, you sort of draw the outline of it and then draw the details of it and so on. Well, in art class, you learn that you can draw an object not by doing that, but by drawing everything that's behind it and by implying the object, as it were. Come on, come on. Oh, we have a visitor today. Oh, my goodness. You want to... Uh, do you, want, do you want to give some commentary on Sartre's phenomenological ontology from the quadruped point of view? <laughs> Is that what you're up to today? <laughs> okay, so a little bit of an interloper in today's class. Do you want to provide some commentary? Oh, you want to get down. Okay. So, for instance, let's say you're drawing a picture of a cat. Uh, well, one way you could draw a cat is not by drawing sort of the, the ears and the eyes and the tail and all that, by drawing everything behind it would give you, in a way, the figure of a cat. So, in a sense, Sartre is doing something very similar. So, what Sartre is doing is pointing out that in the perceptual field, things are what they are by dint of their not being what they are not. In other words, what objects are not, in a way, is implicitly defining what they are. And that runs all the way from the perception of particular objects, even to abstract things, like if you think of, a, let's say, a mathematical equation, like a typical equation, like sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. Well, if you're thinking that particular mathematical equation, in a way, that's defined by all of the other equations that it is not. Okay, so, and moreover, it, it defines in a way what you are as a particular for itself. Okay, so what you are as a particular for itself is in a way implicitly defined by everything else that you are not. So what you are not, in a way, implicitly defines what you are. Okay, so if you can follow that logic, then you're getting the main point of what we were talking about last time. And we're going to start off today's class from exactly that point. So, uh... <laughs> Here's the trick about the desire to be God. So we're going to be talking about the section entitled The Desire to Be God in your reading assignment. So 
the desire to be God. So since the four itself is essentially annihilating kind of movement, in other words, the intentionality, let's remember what that word means when we're talking about phenomenology. Intentionality embodies two things. One, it's the actional quality of consciousness, that consciousness is always a doing of a certain kind. And two, the referential quality of consciousness, that consciousness is always referring to something. So perceptual consciousness is the ongoing act of perceiving and also a referent. It is a perceiving of something. Dream consciousness is the act of dreaming and also it has a referent, which is the actual dream that you're dreaming and so on. Okay, so since the four itself is essentially annihilating an ongoing process of negation, which is what allows us to make distinctions perceptually, even abstractly, in terms of what we think we are and so on, it's defined by an ongoing lack of being. So one of the essential attributes of the four itself is an ongoing production of a lack of being that allows us to make distinctions. However, here's the thing about a lack of being. It's also the condition of desire. Okay, so let's say that again. So the condition of a lack of being is also what constitutes desire. Well, how is that so? Because if I have something, I don't desire to have it. Why? Because I already have it. So if I have a hat, I don't desire to have a hat. Well, why don't I desire to have a hat right now? Because I already have a hat. You getting it? In other words, we desire what is absent. We desire what is lacking. You getting it? So desire is in a way defined by what is lacking. And the same is true of desire at the most fundamental level of our being. So this whole business of annihilation and negation is also the condition for our desire, for human desire, not merely for particular objects like hats or whatever, uh, but ultimately desire at the fundamental levels of our being. So we're desiring beings. Why? Because we are a for itself, because the, the intentionality of the for itself is essentially annihilating, annihilating type movement. And uh, as a consequence, uh, we are defined ultimately by a lack, the ongoing production of a lack of being, which is also the condition for desire. Okay, so the question is, if that's true, then what is it ultimately that we desire? Okay, we're back after a little bit of a snafu. Actually, uh, I got a little bit too excited and I knocked the microphone down onto the floor and didn't realize it, so I delivered the whole uh, rest of the lecture with really lousy sound because the microphone was sitting on the floor and I didn't want you to have to endure uh, 15 minutes of totally crappy sound. So uh, let's redo that part of the class. So we ended off with the question, well, what is it at the ontological level that we really desire? And basically, the answer goes like this, that at the most basic levels of our being, what we want is to have what we lack be present. To have, as it were, the lack that defines our desire to be filled in. Well, the thing about that is that if we had uh, the lack in our being filled in, we'd basically be like the in itself. In other words, what we really want is to be sort of fully present, fully there, without having this desiring, annihilating type activity going on. That what we would really like is whatever there is absent for us, whatever there is lacking in our being, to be filled in, to be present in a pure and full way. But the thing about that is that it's exactly how Sartre has already characterized the being of the in itself, the being the kind of being that objects have, that they're, they're, they're just fully present and fully there, and they don't seem to be desiring as far as we know. They don't seem to be doing that annihilating type activity that seems to be the province and attribute of consciousness and allows consciousness to make distinctions between things perceptually and also allows consciousness to distinguish itself from everything else in the universe. Like what we really want is a fullness of being that the in itself has, but here's the trick. The other thing we want is to retain our freedom. Okay, so two sides to our fundamental desire. To have the kind of being that objects there, hence not to be desiring, to have whatever it is we lack be present to us, but at the same time to retain our freedom. Now, Sartre uses kind of a longish 
phrase to describe that, and it's in your notes. So the longish phrase in big bold letters is an in itself for itself, all hyphenated. And hopefully as I'm saying that, let me say it more slowly. An in itself for itself. And not that slowly, don't be such a jerk. Okay, sorry about that. So, and in itself for itself, which is a kind of hybridized or combined condition of the in itself with that full presence of being without a desiring, without a lack of being, and at the same time, the attributes of the for itself, namely to retain freedom. Okay, so for Sartre, the, here's the trick. For Sartre, that condition of the in itself for itself basically maps onto the way that people think about God, or at least have thought about God historically. So, how have people thought about God historically? Well, sort of the obvious point of connection is probably to all of those omni-qualities that God is usually defined, at least the Christian God is defined in terms of. So God is omnipotent, omniscient, so omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, knows everything, omnipresent, present everywhere at once, not only in the universe, but transcendent to the universe. Um, so God, the way God is normally thought of, is as a kind of being that being infinite, being all-powerful, being all-knowing, never has occasion to lack anything. In part, that's because, well, if you're an all-powerful being and you lack something, if you're all-powerful, you could instantly provide for yourself whatever it is you would lack in the first place. So you have no occasion to desire anything, because anything you would desire as a function of your omnipotence and omniscience, and probably omnipresence too, you would be instantaneously able to provide for yourself. So, so God is, in a way, uh, this, this kind of uh, full presence of being without anything missing, lacking nothing, desiring nothing. And at the same time, God retains his freedom. Okay, so God can choose to create universes and create uh, the human race and create everything else, or not, as he see fits, or she, or however you want to conceive of God. Okay, so God, uh, the way God is usually thought of, is as an infinite, omnipotent being without any limits, who consequently has no lack, and who at the same time remains free. Now, here's the problem. The problem is that for human beings, being in itself for itself, in other words, being like God, is a fundamental impossibility. Okay? So why is that a problem? It's a problem because at the most fundamental level, we're insatiable. It's impossible to satiate our desire because our most fundamental desire is itself in principle not commensurate with the reality of human existence. It's impossible to satiate ourselves. And uh, uh, Sartre, in his usual, I think beautifully provocative way, uh, characterizes this condition in one of his pithy little epigrams, man is a useless passion. And here, the word passion is meant to get at this desiring element of our being. Useless means that, well, not just that, well, we're, well, it means a couple things at the same time. One of which is this whole business of the impossibility of fulfilling our passion, fulfilling our fundamental desire. Uh, so it also means that, well, our passion exceeds the outer bounds of practicality. So useless in that sense too, not defined by utility or usefulness. But the thing that we're focusing on now is uh, the impossibility of our passion. So we are uh, to dream the impossible dream, okay? So that would be one way of, uh, that was a way historically of characterizing Don Quixote, okay? so. Uh, to dream the impossible dream, that we're all dreamers in a sense of the impossible dream, that our desire, when it comes down to it, is impossible to fulfill because ultimately what we really want is to be God. Okay? So, and this is, this is, a, uh, this is definitely a provocative, semi-blasphemous way probably of characterizing human existence. But like I told you before, uh, the French, and especially the Parisian intellectuals, they love provocation and they love saying things in the most provocative way possible. So, uh, ultimately, the reason why 
um, satisfaction in life is such a damn fleeting thing, if we're honest about it, is because ultimately there's always something else for us to, to desire because ultimately our desire is never satiated because it's insatiable in principle. We are insatiable beings at the very ground level. You know, and this explains uh, some everyday stuff. So the last paragraph I wanted to get into uh, before we cut an end to this video, I know when the video is going to end because I already did this lecture a few minutes ago, so I can sort of time it out a little bit more obviously. Unfortunately, I had to delete some, some additional visits from Lucky the Cat. Um, so uh, I sort of enjoy his presence in these lectures. Um, anyhow, so uh, some everyday things like, have you ever noticed, even if you're a student, how fleeting the pleasures afforded you by your participation in commodity culture really are? Okay, so uh, let's say uh, that you want to buy something because you've been, your desire is coalesced in the particular form of a very particular in itself, a very particular object, and you want to end up possessing it by way of the dynamics of commodity culture. So you've become a little bit intoxicated with it, so you work really hard to get it. Let's say it's a, a new pair of shoes or something like that. So uh, you want this new pair of shoes and your desire is, is sort of constellated itself around owning this new pair of shoes. And so you work real hard and you dream about it and you get on Amazon.com or eBay or name your poison in the 21st century, I guess. And so you look at it and you sort of lust after it for a while. Then eventually you end up getting the new shoes. And the weird thing about experiences like that is how fleeting the satisfaction is really it's like well you know if it's if it's something you really really wanted the satisfaction might last i don't know a couple weeks maybe a month something like that but in in fairly short order it's just another damn pair of shoes like cluttering up your closet you know well where did all that satisfaction go well uh it went where they all go like sort of down the drain. Well, why do they all go down the drain? Why are you never finally and completely satisfied even by the things that you lust after the most? The reason why, ultimately, from a Sartrean point of view, is that your desire in principle is impossible to satisfy. You're trying to satisfy something that is fundamentally unsatisfiable by way of your participation in commodity culture, but like ultimately, what you really want is to be like God. And okay, like buying yourself a new pair of shoes that like looks cool and feels cool and oh, I feel like special and I'm about to be fulfilled as a damn human being. And it's like, yeah, all of that like ultimately is just one particular sort of fractal element within a much larger gestalt. And the much larger gestalt is that when it comes down to it, you really wouldn't mind being God. Okay, so and that's a that's a obviously provocative thing to say. All right, so and uh, or let's take other examples which I've sort of noted in your notes. Like, have you ever noticed how like people who attain great success, not just buying a new pair of shoes? I just wanted to give you an everyday example first, so you could relate to it. But like, look at sort of the larger sphere of things. It's like people who win Oscars or major uh, awards of some kind or win a world. A series ring or a Super Bowl ring or something like that. It's like, well, what are they trying to do Do, 99% of the time? Well, they're trying to win another Super Bowl ring. It's like one isn't enough. And it's like, or win another Oscar. And it's like, well, damn, you know, if you've won a Super Bowl or you've won an Oscar or something like that, odds are you're extremely rich and you're extremely popular and uh, you can't buy yourself a drink anymore. All right, you know what I'm saying? You can't buy yourself a drink because you're that popular. And you have like a lot of what most people would want in life at some level. And you have it in abundance. Well, why is it that that's never enough for people? You know, the people who win Oscars are almost what they do after they win an Oscar. And yeah, they have a little moment of celebration. They feel good and all that. And then they're trying to win another one. People who win one Super Bowl ring are trying to win another one. People who bowl a 300 game are trying to bowl another one. Like people who self-actualize. Ooh, self-actualization. That's up in the ante a little bit because, well, what self-actualization is about is sort of fulfilling uh, your deeper possibilities in life. Well, people who self-actualize, usually they want to do it more often or more deeply or more thoroughly or more faithfully or something like that. So why isn't anything enough for us? 
And the Sartrean answer is because our desire is impossible to fulfill in principle. It's because all of our particular desires are resting upon a hidden foundation that is itself impossible to fulfill because at the end of the day, nothing will satisfy us short of being God, short of an impossible condition. So we are ultimately all a kind of useless passion. All right, so, um, all right, so uh, since I've done this lecture before, at this point, I think I want to end this video a little bit shorter than average because I want to do the next part in one video. So the next one will be the last video on Sartre. So until then, uh, enjoy your day, enjoy your coronavirus quarantine as best you can. Um, uh, probably you're feeling all kinds of odd sorts of desires that seem impossible to fulfill at this point because the coronavirus has a way of making our desires perhaps a little bit more pointed and a little bit more obvious. But at any rate, enjoy your day and uh, I'll be seeing you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.